Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Maxwell from the Department of Geospatial Science at Bradford University. And today I wanted to record a video to show you some climate data sources for environmental analysis, but in my field for paleoclimatology and dendrochronology. So there are a lot of data sources out there, but the challenge for people beginning in this work is often that they can't find them. And so I'm just going to give you a quick few sites today that I visit on a frequent basis. Let's start out with a screen share. So <clears throat> start out with my um, website. This is the tree ringist. I mainly use this for my CV, uh, my lab, and for Dendro Help. And so on my Dendro Help site, you can see that there is a link here. And I'm going to open that up. And it will show you useful dendrochronology links. <clears throat> In addition to um, that, on the Dendro Help page, there's a bunch of video tutorials that I've built for Q Recorder, C Dendro, PC Reg, and other things to help new dendros uh, get into the field and do this work. Some of this was published recently as a research note in Dendrochronologia. Uh, feel free to cite that if you're using that work. But for the climatology data, we can look at a variety of links to databases all around the world. Uh, so you can check out other things in here if you're interested in software, hardware, other types of Dendro data. To start out, there's the National Climate Data Center. Here we have the National Climate Data Center hosted by NOAA and the National Centers for Environmental Information. This is a massive clearinghouse for data in the United States, North America, and around the world. I use this on a regular basis to get weather data for physical geography courses and chronological analysis. You can search for some of this through mapping, uh, but if you know kind of where you're going, you can use the search tool and select the types of data sets that you would like. And so, for example, we may want uh, monthly normals, <clears throat> Maybe we want that for a specific date range. Uh, we could just choose one the month, but here you could choose a list of years. You could have it for a station or maybe for a climate division. And then uh, we could put in here um, Southwest Virginia and see if we can find our, our station. And so <clears throat> this will allow us to pull out station data here for Southwest Virginia. And we can add that to our card and, and then have a link to download that. Most of these files are going to be in some type of uh, text file format. So tab delimited or comma separated variable file, a CSV file. And so it will depend on the type of data source and location and the, um, what the format will actually be. So um, you can check out all kinds of different data sources through, um, through that link. And so that could be your first stop if you're a researcher in the United States looking for data. <clears throat> now, there are some other data sources that I often use for the United States. In particular, um, I do reconstructions of snow water equivalent. And so you could visit the Snowtel or Snow Telemetry uh, website and you could select out uh, your particular state and your particular areas that you want to collect and get the historic data for snow levels um, uh, through time. And a lot of those stations go back to the 80s, some all the way back to the 30s. So a lot of data there too for snow. Uh, for streamflow, the US Geologic Survey streamflow data sets are pretty extensive and you can download for individual gauges all around the United States. And so, uh, you may look uh, just at the map initially <clears throat> to identify a gauge. And so if I move into say Southwest Virginia and I wanna look for a gauge on the New River, <clears throat> I could go ahead and click on one of these gauges and access the data here. Uh, again, you can look at these from a, a variety of manners, daily statistics, monthly statistics and so forth. And, um, and then download the data sets uh, by kind of following through their menus. Again, here, these are going to be tab separated types of data. And um, you can, oh, and you can kind of see um, what is available for you. And so <clears throat> all of these data sets are 
are freely available um, through the USGS. Now, typically when I'm doing uh, climate response analysis in dendrochronology or for dendroclimatology, um, I will want monthly data for that, <clears throat> occasionally daily data. Uh, one data source that I use on a pretty frequent basis for student projects is the PRISM Climate Group data set. This is an interpolated product that will allow you to select um, a cell anywhere in the United States and download data for it. And so you can get to that by going to the Explorer. Here, you could type in your latitude and longitude, but I'm actually already zoomed into our Salu Conservation property at Radford University, uh, where I have a student project going on for my senior seminar. <clears throat> and we want to download data for um, monthly climate variables like precipitation, minimum temperature, and maximum temperature. <clears throat> Here, you would just select precipitation, monthly values, and then your date range going all the way back to 1895. We are using you know, metric units. We are going to allow to interpolate and predict a zonal mean for that cell. And then we can retrieve the time series. We can view it and then we can download it. And you'll see that that actually looks like <clears throat> a text file. And it has a header on the top and then it has columns for date, month, and then the precipitation value. Now, this can be challenging to format some of these data sets. Uh, you will have to work through some of that. But if you're using PRISM in particular, um, I do have in my useful dendrochronology uh, links up here, we have some code associated with the North American Dendro Ecological Field Week, NADF, and in particular, my GitHub page. Um, not a great programmer, but I know how to do some things that are funky but functional. And here you could get PRISM uh, formatting code that would uh, allow you to read in any of those downloaded files and convert it to a file that has a year column and 12 months of data, uh, which is a common format that you might use. You could also break it into year month data set as well. Uh, so a three column format. So those options are available to you. Um, if you are a researcher in a country outside the United States, you may not have uh, such large clearinghouses like the, the NOAA databases, uh, but there are some great uh, resources, in particular, the KNMI Climate Explorer. Uh, the KNMI Climate Explorer <clears throat> is a great service and it allows you to do a lot of data analysis in it. That's a complete separate video, but you can access the actual data sources in the background. So you could dig in and get monthly station data. You could put in your latitude and longitude and extract data for your site. Uh, we could go to a field um, of observations. And here we could look at a whole array of different products. So temperature uh, for land, uh, precipitation, air temperature, drought, sea level pressure, cloud cover, everything. And we could say, just select the Hadley crew temperature data set anomalies. And we could get a grid cell for uh, around Radford, Virginia, down in southwestern Virginia. So that's 37 degrees north, uh, negative 79 degrees or 79 degrees west. And if we hit make time series, it's going to pull out the cell that that, um, that uh, Latin long lands on. And here you can see the data going back to 1850. If we want to download it, we can click this raw data link and download the raw data. Now you have to do some data cleanup maybe for formatting, but this is a really great resource to access those massive databases uh, in a really efficient manner. And so I encourage you guys to check out the Climate Explorer for that. Other ways for be uh, beginning uh, people would be to use Google Earth interfaces. So there is the um, <clears throat> crew data set, the climate research unit data set for temperature and precipitation around the world. And you can download this file right here. It is a KML for Google Earth and allows you to interactively grab your data. And so I already have it loaded up here in Google Earth. And it starts out with five degree grid blocks. And I'm going to be doing some new work in Zambia, teaching a workshop there. So we'll just zoom into Zambia. And if we click on that cell, it'll allow us to then get the half degree grid cells. And I am going to be in the area of Kitwe. 
And so if I click on the Kitway cell, here we can actually have a visual of the, of the data. This is a really great way to download data sets that are global in nature. And if we're kind of interested in the quality of the data, we can click on to see what are the contributing stations that are used to calculate those grid cells um, for temperature and precipitation. And if we wanted to actually uh, download one of those grid cells, we can click on the data button. And here you go. You can get the year month value column. And then the number of observations is the number of stations that are used to calculate that value. So now you can get data worldwide in a matter of a few clicks on Google Earth. Now, all that said, there are ways to get data sources like the crew data set and a lot of the NOAA data sets through some packages in R. That's a little bit of a higher level thing. And so you may not be comfortable with extracting data like that. And so I, I highly encourage you to check out a lot of these links to get you data sources um, in the United States and across the world. If you're interested in other software help, um, you can check out some of the links here for um, programming in R and cross-dating, as well as some of the tree ring specific programs like RSTEM and, um, and signal free detrending. So that's it for now. Um, perhaps I'll be back and show you some other types of data sources in the future. Take care.